What's going on guys? It's Hank from Sprues and Brews, and today we're gonna to be talking all about the essential paints for scale modeling. The scale modeling industry has really blown up over the last couple of decades, and there are dozens of companies producing kits and supplies and paint, and it can make it really tricky to navigate through all these choices and find the right paint for the project that you're working on. So in this video, I'm gonna show you my recommendations for paints that have worked really well for me over the years. We'll cover some of the basics first, and then we'll get into some specifics based on subjects, and hopefully try and find some paints that are gonna be perfect for you in your next project. I'll add some chapter markers in the video here so you can hop right to the section with the specific subject that you're looking for, but I recommend sticking around for the whole thing so you can cover all your bases. So, if that sounds good to you, grab yourself a beverage, get cozy, let's check it out. All right guys, before we get into the specifics, just a couple important points to note. First of all, I can only speak to what I know, so any of the paints I recommend today are gonna to be ones that I've used in the past and I've really liked. These are my go-tos that I'm using for pretty much every project that comes across my bench, so hopefully they work out great for you. I'm primarily a military scale modeler with a focus on World War II era vehicles, but these paints are gonna work for pretty much any project you pick up. They're just specifically designed for World War II vehicles. Also, I'm not sponsored by any of these brands. These are just products that I really like and I really trust and hopefully you guys will like them too. Now, this video is part of my beginner series for folks just getting into scale modeling, but even if you've been doing this for years, hopefully these paint recommendations will be helpful. If you've been looking for some new paints or you've been stuck and not super happy with the paints you're using, hopefully these ones work out better for you. On that note, if you are just getting into the hobby, I have a couple other videos for best kits for beginners and best equipment for beginners. If you wanna check those out too, I'll leave links in the description below. And lastly, I'll have links for all the products we talk about today in the description below. So if you wanna pick them up for yourselves, you know where to find them. All right, with all that finally out of the way, let's get to the fun stuff. All right, so to start with today, we're gonna to cover some essentials that you're gonna need for pretty much any project you're working on. The first thing I have on my list is a thinner. So if you're gonna be doing airbrushing work, which I highly recommend, again, if you haven't seen my best tools for beginners, check that video out, it talks a little bit about airbrushing, and I think airbrushing in general is a huge game changer for folks that wanna really step up their skills in scale modeling. But that said, a thinner is really important. Um, I either use Tamiya's acrylic thinner or Vallejo's airbrush thinner, pretty much interchangeable, they work just about the same. But one thing that I like to do is between every color that I'm painting or spraying in my airbrush, I run a little water through the brush to kind of clear it out and then I make sure it's actually super clear by running some airbrush thinner through it. It helps keep my equipment safe and clean and working well. Um, so when I put it away and I pick it up for the next time I'm gonna work, it's ready to rock and roll. So I highly, highly recommend picking up a good thinner that's reliable. I like the Vallejo one and the Tamiya one, like I said. So make sure you have a good thinner handy. In addition, if you're working with paints that aren't pre-thinned and ready for airbrushing, you gotta have a good thinner. So pick one of these up. Next, a really good habit to get into is using a primer. So what a primer coat does is basically you're gonna spray this down on the model before you get started on the actual painting, the actual camouflage scheme. It's gonna give you a nice solid base to work with, a nice flat base that you can paint over. And it's also gonna help highlight any imperfections in your actual build. So if you missed cleaning up some flash or there's any parts on the model that need to be cleaned up, it's kind of hard to tell sometimes when it's bare plastic, but after you've primed the model, you can kind of see these things a little better. So I like to use Vallejo's surface primer. This is a black acrylic surface primer. Um, it comes in this big boy bottle or in this little one, whatever works for you. I like the big one because it lasts a little longer, um, but this stuff is great. There's a nice built-in nozzle here so you can spray it, you can pour it rather, in your airbrush super easily. It's gonna last you a really long time and it gives you a nice clean coat airbrushes super well. I love this stuff, it's my go-to. So definitely pick up a primer. The final thing we're gonna talk about in this basic section is varnishes. And if you're not aware of what a varnish is, or a clear coat layer, some folks call it clear coat, varnish, they're interchangeable, um, is a protective layer that's clear, as the name kind of indicates, that's gonna go over your work and protect it for future or subsequent layers of weathering or painting, etc. So. The first one that I like to use, this is by AK Interactive. This is their intermediate gauzy agent. Um, it's the shine enhancer kind. And what I use this for basically is after I've painted my model, um, I'm gonna spray a coat of this over the whole kit. And what that's gonna do is it's gonna protect our paint layer so when we continue in the process and we do weathering and we start using some potentially more caustic chemicals, enamels, or oils, it's not gonna damage the paint layer. It's not gonna damage all of our work. It's gonna protect it, create this nice um, 
dry to the touch finish on our kit and it's gonna allow us to move on to the weathering process. The reason we use a gloss coat is because that's gonna allow um, any of our weathering products that we use to really flow into all the nooks and crannies on our vehicle and it just allows those weathering products, like I said, to kind of work better on the surface of your model. So after I paint all of my kits, the first step is to spray the whole thing with some AK Interactive Gauzy Agent. It's gonna protect our work and it's gonna get it ready for the next layers. After I've done all my weathering, I'm gonna move on to a matte varnish. I like Lucky Matte Varnish from Ammo. Um, they make this, it's really user-friendly product and it sprays super well out of the airbrush. Um, what this does basically is after you've done all your weathering, it's gonna protect that work and it's gonna be a final seal coat on your model. But unlike the glossy AK Interactive product, this is matte, so it's gonna be a flat finish, it's not gonna be shiny, which is exactly what we want for you know military vehicles in the field. They're not shiny, reflective, super clean things. We want them to just be a nice flat coat. So I like these two varnishes, this one before weathering and this one after weathering to make sure that all of my work's protected and it's not gonna get dinged up or scratched up when I'm handling it and we're not gonna be knocking off any of the elements that we just put on there paint-wise. So just to recap on our basics here real quick, we wanna make sure we have a reliable thinner, an acrylic thinner that we can use for airbrushing and thinning our paints if we're gonna do thinned airbrush paints. A good um, primer coat, I like Vallejo's black acrylic primer and then a couple of varnishes. We wanna have a good gloss varnish and a good matte varnish. So for our first subject here, we're gonna cover one that's really popular for World War II scale modelers, and that's gonna be German aircraft or Luftwaffe aircraft. German aircraft from that period have some of the most interesting camouflage schemes, at least in my opinion, but there are so many colors that are involved that sometimes it can be a little tough to navigate. Fortunately though, with most stereotypically German things, there's a pretty organized system that we can follow to make sure that we're picking the right paints. The German aircraft ministry during World War II and in the lead up to World War II had a color-coded system called RLM, or I'm gonna make sure I get this right, but I'm probably gonna butcher the pronunciation, uh, Reichsluftart Ministerium, um, and that was the German aviation ministry. But they had this color coding system that made sure that aircraft manufacturers and paint manufacturers and the actual Luftwaffe crews in the field had some sort of organizational structure for the paints that they were putting on these aircraft to kind of match the designated and approved color codes for camouflage schemes that were passed down from the German high command. So RLM color scheme is the important thing to remember there, and it's gonna help us find the paints that we need. Now, there were a lot of different RLM colors that were approved and that were recommended for these various aircraft types and various theaters of the war, but I've narrowed my collection down to 11 paints that pretty much cover any Luftwaffe bird that I'm trying to build. And I know that kind of sounds like a lot, 11 is a lot, but depending on the specific time frame of aircraft that you're looking to build, hopefully we can help narrow down and you can get the you know five or six paints that you really need for the aircraft that you're working on. And the great thing about collecting paints like this and building more and more projects is that you're not gonna use a whole bottle for one build, so you can keep it in your leftovers, keep it in a, some sort of organizational system like this, so the next time you wanna make a German aircraft, you're already gonna have the paint ready to go. So all of these paints that I like to use for Luftwaffe aircraft are by Ammo MIG. And one of the nice things about these Ammo products is that they come pre-thinned and they're ready to go right in the airbrush. So you don't have to do any mixing yourself. There's a little ball in here that you can't really hear, um, but that's gonna help you shake up the paint and it's gonna be ready to rock and roll when you put it in your airbrush. So awesome from Ammo MIG and I really appreciate that. And they also really nail the Luftwaffe colors. I think these are great. So I'm gonna flash up on screen here. These are the 11 colors that I use. Um, for 99% of my Luftwaffe projects. And these are all the actual RLM names that would have been prescribed by the German Air Ministry to help you reference. So most of these ammo products have that exact name right on the bottle there, but if you were to search for RLM 71 Ammo MIG on Google, it's gonna bring up the product that you're looking for. Like I said in the intro, I'll also have links to all these in the description below if you wanna pick some up for yourself. So this is all 11 of the colors, but if we jump forward here, and look at some of the time frames. we can kind of narrow down specifically what we're gonna need for each aircraft. So if you're making an early war aircraft, and by early war, I'm talking like Battle of France, Battle of Britain. Um, these are mostly gonna be BF 109Es and BF 109, well, yeah, I guess some BF 109Fs, but mostly BF 109E3s and E4s, as well as the, some of the German bombers, Stukas, Ju 88s, et cetera, that are gonna be used during that period. So RLM 76 on the bottom left there, that is gonna be used for your bellies, for the underside of most of these aircraft. It's a light blue color. 
Other than that, RLM 02, RLM 71, RLM 74, and RLM 75 are gonna be your primary camouflage colors for the top side of the aircraft and the wings. Um, so I'll show a couple examples here. I, I did a couple of early war Luftwaffe aircraft last year. This is Adolf Galant's BF 109E4 from around the Battle of Britain time. And you can see that it's mostly these muted greens, um, green browns here, green brown grays. And you can see that RLM 76 on the belly of the aircraft. Another one that I did up last year, um, this is Vander Mulder's aircraft from around the same time. And you can see it's those same colors there. Um, so a nice muted greenish tone on the top, a variety of splinter or kind of, you know, mixed modeled on camouflage there along those color schemes and a light blue bottom. So if you're building an aircraft from this early war Battle of Britain period, your main camouflage colors are gonna be covered with these, these five colors basically. So those are my recommendations for go-tos if you're doing an early war Luftwaffe aircraft. If we move down south a little bit, we start looking at Africa Corps aircraft, um, aircraft that were used during the fighting in the North African front. Um, the two primary colors that we're gonna need here are RLM 78, which is another light blue, it's called Hellblau. Um, and that would be used on the belly of the aircraft as well. So if you think you're on the ground and you're looking up at an aircraft flying over, it's gonna have a light blue color to kind of match the sky. Um, and if you're in the desert, the top color is primarily gonna be this RLM 79, which is this desert dusty sand color. So if you're gonna make a German fighter from the North African front, these are the two colors I recommend you pick up. If we move on a little further into the mid late war period, we start getting a lot more colors and a lot more diverse than the colors that we have. They're all in a similar muted camouflage color palette, but we have some more specifics here to work with. All the colors that applied in the beginning are gonna kind of roll over to here. We don't see RLM 02 as much, but some of those low 70 RLM color codes are still gonna be floating around. That said, we are also gonna introduce um, some of the higher RLM 80s. So RLM 81, 82, 83, and 84 are also gonna come to the scene. Um, we've got some more variants on green and some violet colors mixed in there as well. So I'll flash up on the screen here. Um, this is an Eric Hartman BF 109G6 that I made last year. And you can see it's got a lot more of those violets and greens in it as well. Um, so if you were to compare it to one of those early war aircraft, it's got a little darker tone to it. So yeah, those are the 11 paints that I use for my Luftwaffe aircraft. They're all from Ammo MIG and they're all ready to rock and roll and go right in your airbrush. These have worked super well for me and hopefully they work well for your projects. Um, that said, this is just a generalization. As I mentioned, there are a lot more RLM colors that were used and approved for Luftwaffe aircraft. These are just the ones that I feel cover 95 to 99% of the projects you're gonna be working on if you're doing Luftwaffe aircraft. So these are my recommendations um, and hopefully they work out well for you. All right, so moving on, but sticking with our aircraft theme here, we're gonna talk about some US aircraft. So USAAF, US Army Air Corps aircraft, as well as some US Navy and Marine Corps aircraft. Um, so the name of the game, mostly here for uh, US Army aircraft, Air, Air Corps vehicles, is gonna be either olive drab, variants of olive drab, or natural metal finish, which we call NMF in the hobby. And that just means like that bare aluminum that you'd see on like a B-29 Super Fortress or something like that. Um, so basically what we're gonna do here is I like to use three different kinds of olive drab as a, as a good starting point. Again, like with our last section, I like to use Ammo MIG products for this. They airbrush really well. Um, and let me just make sure I've got my colors here. Yeah, so the three that I like to use are, where are they? Da, 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 da. Well, I can't find one of them, but um, I like to use just a regular olive drab base from Ammo. This works really well for your, your main olive drab color that you're gonna be using. So if you're making an olive drab aircraft, the top surfaces of the wing and the top of the fuselage are good with olive drab. Another thing I like to try and do is play with highlights and shadows a little bit within olive drab. So I like to use an olive drab light base and an olive drab dark base. Um, again, these are both from Ammo MIG. And the nice thing is that if you're sticking with that main color of just an olive drab base and you wanna try and pop and play with the, the color modulation a little bit, you could spray the whole section with olive drab base 
And then some of the higher parts, like if we're talking a, an aircraft, along the spine of the aircraft, the fuselage, and on some of the upper surfaces of the wing, you could spray those with a little bit of olive drab light base to kind of create some highlights. You know, think of the parts of the aircraft that are hit with sun more than others. And then on some of the darker sections around the wing roots maybe, or places that wouldn't be in as much direct sunlight, you can spray those with some olive drab dark base. And we're all using one color here, just kind of on the same, on that spectrum. And we can create a lot of um, dynamic lighting effects just with those three shades of olive drab. So I recommend picking up a basic olive drab base. And then if you wanna get a little more creative with it and kind of play with highlights and shadows, you can get an olive drab light base and an olive drab dark base. In addition, if you wanna mess around a little more, Ammo has a USAAF olive drab. This is only a little different from that olive drab base, a little lighter, um, but it's just another color you can mess with there. So one thing I like to do with olive drab aircraft like that is sometimes I'll mask off different panels. So like if I'm doing a B-17, I'll mask off one of the elevator flaps and I'll spray that a little lighter than the rest of the aircraft or part of the tail might be a little darker than the rest of the aircraft. And it just adds vis visual interest to the model. So. Um, those are some of the olive drabs that I like to use for U.S. aircraft. For the belly of U.S. aircraft, um, and this will apply to the Navy and Marine aircraft we cover in a minute here, I like to use a variety of grays depending on the, the subject and the kind of look I'm going for here. Um, gray light base by Ammo works pretty well. I also like gray highlight if I'm going to try and go a little lighter than that. There's also a medium gray that they make that works pretty well. I'll have links for all those in the description below. But one thing, don't go with a pure white for the belly of these aircraft. You might look at reference photos and think, oh, it's white, I can just go with white. But I think it's a lot better to go with grays, variations of light and dark grays for the belly of the aircraft. Because you think about it, these have been out in the field and they're, they're gonna get a little, a little worn down. So you're gonna do weathering effects later in the process to kind of knock down that tone a little bit. But I do think it's a good idea to go with the gray rather than a white. White just looks way too stark when you use it as the belly and it's next to an olive drab or another darker color on the top of the plane. So I recommend going with one of those grays from Ammo. If we move to the Pacific theater for a little bit and we look at some US Navy, US Marine Corps aircraft, the two colors that I recommend picking up are sea blue and interim blue. So interim blue is gonna be the kind of lighter blue that you see on some earlier war, 1942-43 aircraft. So Battle of Midway, this was like the main color that they were using for these aircraft. Um, if you look at pictures of F4F Wildcats, it's usually that interim blue. Uh, I did this Wildcat last year. I'll flash it up right now. This is in interim blue. The whole upper surface of that aircraft is interim blue. Um, later, after roughly after the Battle of Midway, they started introducing a sea blue as a, as a third camouflage color. So we have the light belly of the aircraft, the intermediate blue for the wings and like the midsection of the fuselage. And then the spines will usually be treated with sea blue, which is a little darker. You also see a lot of like F4U Corsairs from later in the war might be all sea blue on the top. Um, it's a little darker, but yeah. Interim blue and sea blue from Ammo MiG, these are my two go-tos for US Navy, US Marine Corps aircraft. Another important color, and I mentioned this in the beginning of this section, is natural metal finish, so aluminums. Um, later in the war, you'll notice that you start to see B-17s, for example, or any of the fighters, P-51s, P-47s, etc., that earlier in the war would have been olive drab, they would have been you know, variants of green. They stopped painting them. They just realized that there was, they were, had such air superiority in the European theater of operations and later in the Pacific theater of operations with some of the B-29s and stuff that they didn't need to camouflage the planes anymore. It seems kind of crazy, but these planes were so big that all that paint, it's heavy. It's actually adding weight to the aircraft. So they stopped painting them an all over camouflage scheme. Um, I'm not an expert with natural metal finishes. I, it's a really tricky skill to learn, but the colors that I do like to use are from Vallejo. This is their metallics line. Ooh, this is their metallics line. I like their aluminum and white aluminum. They're just a little different um, from each other, but I think that having at least two different tones of aluminum can be really helpful when you're playing with natural metal finishes. So one thing that I'll try and do when I'm doing an NMF aircraft is similar to what I was saying with the olive drabs before, I'll mask off certain areas of the aircraft. So say I spray the whole thing with just regular aluminum and I wanna create some highlights or some you know, visual interest on the aircraft. I'll mask off some of the panels on the plane and spray those with white aluminum. So when we remove the masks, 
Everything's aluminum. It looks all like just bare metal, but some parts are a little lighter or some parts are a little darker than others. So I would recommend getting a couple or maybe a few different um, aluminum metallics. I like the Vallejo ones. Again, these spray really nice right out of the airbrush. You can also brush paint them, you know, just using your brush right onto the kit if you need to. Um, but this is great stuff. So I would recommend if you're gonna do something in a natural metal finish, pick up some Vallejo metallics like this. All right, so a couple weird colors to cover before we move on here. Um, these are just some of the odds and ends. One that's really important to pick up though is, this is also from Ammo, this is Zinc Chromate Yellow. And one thing you'll notice is that the cockpits, the interior of World War II fighters particularly, were this weird kind of light green color. Um, so the way I achieved that is that I use this Zinc Chromate Yellow and I mix it with a little bit of olive drab, any of the olive drabs that I'm working with. And I'll use that to spray the interior of my aircraft. I think it finds a nice, I think it, it's a nice balance and it kind of replicates that color pretty well. The other thing that this is gonna be used for is the interior of flaps. So I'll flash up a, a video real quick here. This is a P47 Thunderbolt that I did last year. And you'll notice that the flaps are open, the flaps are down rather, and you can see this zinc chromate in those areas that are usually covered when the flaps are up. Um, so you'll see that on a lot of World War II USAF aircraft. So it's important to pick up this zinc chromate if you wanna try and replicate that look. In addition to that, there's a few other ones here. Satin white is good to have. Um, sometimes a lot of these aircraft would have like a white nose or a white bar around the engine cowling. Satin white is a good color for that. You're also gonna want a flat black. I just like Ammo's matte black. This one works pretty well. Again, you can spray it right out of the airbrush. Um, gotta have a white and a black, especially for aircraft. You're gonna have something, whether it's a stripe or some sort of thing that you want there, good to have a black and a white. And lastly is a red for the same reason. Um, a lot of these World War II aircraft would have, the US aircraft would have some sort of stripe on them. Um, and if you're looking for a red, I like ammos. Um, I've also got a Vallejo Model Air one here. They work pretty well. Red is a little tricky to spray, so just be really patient with it. Test it on something ahead of time and then make sure you've got your area masked off nicely before you spray this on so you don't make a mess of your model. But important to have a zinc chromate yellow. I think this is a really good one, especially for Eastern Theater of Operations, um, sorry, European Theater of Operation vehicles, a good black and a white and a red. So that is gonna be it for US aircraft and for aircraft in general. Full disclosure, I don't make a ton of RAF aircraft. I know that's terrible and it makes me look like a silly American. It's on my list for this year. I wanna do some Spitfires and Hurricanes and you name it, the, the, the good ones. Um, so I can't speak with authority to RAF colors today, but we'll save that for another video. So please forgive me for now. All right, so we're gonna switch gears a little bit here and move down to ground vehicles or AFVs. That's Armored Fighting Vehicles. You'll hear that acronym thrown around sometimes. And the first thing we're gonna cover is German vehicles. So German tanks, half tracks, etc. One thing that I highly recommend if you're just getting into the hobby or just for anybody in the hobby really is multi-packs like this for paint are super useful. Um, they're gonna save you money and you're gonna get a collection of a lot of different colors that you need in one shot, which is great. So this one that I like to use a lot, this is an early German colors pack from Ammo. Um, and it comes with six different paints here that you're gonna need it's gonna help cover almost all of the armored vehicles that you do um, in, in a German scheme like this. So the two main ones that you're gonna see are Dunkelgrau and Dunkelgelb. Dunkelgrau, Dunkelgelb, remember those. Um, Dunkelgrau is gonna be your gray. It's your early war gray. Um, so you think early tanks on the, on the Eastern Front, like the early Tigers, um, Panzer IIs, Panzer Threes, stuff from the, the Blitzkrieg is gonna be in that gray color. So that is your Dunkel Grau. The later war ones are gonna be in Dunkel Gelb. Once they switched over to that yellow brown color um, a little later in the war, that's gonna be Dunkel Gelb. So those are your main two and they come with this kit, which is great. So Dunkel Gelb, Dunkel Grau, both from Ammo MIG. Other than that, um, when you start to see the, the tri-color camo schemes on some of those yellow uh, vehicles in particular, They've got a green and a brown. Um, the green is this olive grown. It's just a kind of a mid rich green tone here that would have been used as a camouflage, as a camouflage color given to the, the crews in the field to apply a camouflage to their vehicles. The other one would be this chocobron, which is a, it's a really nice chocolatey brown. So when you put the Dunkelgelb 
and these green and browns together, you can get a really nice tricolor scheme. I'll flash up some pictures of uh, a Panther tank that I did recently um, using this tricolor scheme. Works out really well. So these three are great if you are trying to do mid to late war German vehicles. Um, Dunkel Grau is perfect for your early war Blitzkrieg era vehicles. Um, the two other paints that come in this kit that are great is a Crema Weiss. Um, this is like an off-white eggshell white. This is perfect for interiors. So um, even if you're not doing a kit with an interior, if you have a hatch open, the inside of the hatch would be this Crema Weiss color. So this is a good one. Um, super handy that they put this in here. I end up using this for a lot of different things. Um, I use this for like the interiors of US vehicles as well. So great to have. Um, and then the last one in here, I don't use as much. This is a Polizzi Gren. Um, it's like a, like a bluish gray, bluish green. And the example that they have on the box is for like a, a half track, any air, hair, half, anti air half track vehicle. Um, I don't use this as much, but it is a good one to have in this stash. So if I recommend picking up any of these colors, or you're not going to get them in the pack, definitely go with a Dunkel Gelb for later war vehicles and a Dunkel Grau. Um, in addition to that, the shock brown and the olive grun are super important for tricolor camouflage schemes of German tanks. Um, so yeah, if you're looking to get started, I would pick up a six pack like this. Um, Ammo has these great little mix packs. They're, as I was saying with all the other segments in the video, they're, they're pretty thin, they're ready to rock and roll. You put them right in your airbrush and they work super well. So I would recommend picking up those basic colors if you're interested in doing German tanks or AFEs. So if we shift over to the other side, we start looking at allied vehicles. Um, it's gonna be pretty similar to the stuff we talked about for the US aircraft, actually. So these colors are great for US tanks, half tracks, etc., as well as British Commonwealth vehicles. Um, this is also gonna be stuff that works really well for Russian vehicles. Um, lots of shades of green we're working with here. It's pretty simple on the allied side. Um, so as we said before, I like to go with a simple olive drab base from Ammo MIG. That's gonna be my, my main camo coat for like a Sherman tank, for example. I'm gonna do a similar thing um, with, with these vehicles and do a little highlight and shadow work. So I think it's a good idea beyond just your olive drab base to have an olive drab light base and an olive drab dark base. That way, um, for example, if you're doing an M4, like I said, you can spray the whole main surface of the vehicle with an olive drab base. And then you can spray some of the top parts, so like the top of the turret, the top of the gun barrel, um, and the top of the actual body of the tank itself, the hull of the tank, with like a light olive drab base. Then lower parts of the vehicle, like, you know, inside, below the, below the wheels, underneath the tracks and stuff there, underneath the front of the glasses plate, you can spray that with a dark olive drab, dark olive drab base. And then when you're looking at the vehicle, before you've done any weathering or anything like that, it's already gonna have a little bit of color modulation and some artificial shadow work there. So if you're doing allied vehicles in olive drab of any sort, whether it's um, a US tank, a US vehicle, a British Churchill or a Cromwell, or even a T-34 over on the Russian side, olive drab is a great, great palette to work with here. I like my ammo make olive drabs. Um, in addition to that, if you're doing specifically Russian vehicles, um, ammo has a great Russian green. I like to use this for T-34s and stuff. You can get away with using the olive drab, but this Russian green is a little more accurate. It's a little richer of a color. The olive drab is pretty muted. So if you're gonna get into a lot of Russian vehicles, I recommend picking up this Russian green from Ammo MIG. Otherwise, if you're just experimenting, maybe it's your first, first T-34, if you're primarily a US modeler or primarily a British vehicle modeler, you can get away with using the olive drab, but if you're gonna try a lot of Russian vehicles, I recommend getting this Russian green. Um, that said, other important colors to have, I put it away over here, but you should have a flat black for when you're doing tanks. Um, that applies to the, to the German section as well. If you're doing ta tank tracks and you know the rubber on road wheels and stuff, you're gonna want a, a flat black that works really well. Um, and that should have you pretty well covered. So simple with allied vehicles here, a lot of green. Um, black on the, on the road wheels, on the rubber on the tires there, pretty much the rest of it's green. So a variety of olive drabs are my recommendation. And if you're doing Russian vehicles, it's good to get a specific Russian green from Ammo MIG. All right guys, so we're gonna transition to figures now. This is gonna be primarily brush painting, so actually hand painting with a brush. Um, and the basic pack that I like to use to start with here, this is gonna be for flesh tones. 
um, specifically if you're doing a World War II era model and you have a lot of Caucasian skin types. Um, this is a great kit from Vallejo. This comes with eight different colors um, and I don't need to take them out. I just put them in here for show. They're usually on my display case here. But the colors that come with this, I'll just read them off real quick, are basic skin tone, sunny skin tone, medium flesh tone, dark flesh, light flesh, flat flesh, brown rose, and salmon rose. And that might just seem like a bunch of nonsense, honestly, but it's important to have a lot of different flesh tones when you're working on, on skin colors um, for Caucasian skin in this instance. Um, basically, uh, I've got some videos on figures. I'll, I'll link one here if you wanna check it out, just so you can kind of get an idea of how to paint figures if you haven't done it before. Um, but the name of the game is all about really thin layers and you wanna build up and kind of build a robust color to the face so it actually looks like living flesh. Um, you could start with something like this flat flesh or a medium flesh tone, add some light flesh for the highlights, some dark flesh for the shadows on the face, and it kind of gives you a more of a realistic interpretation of a figure rather than just doing one single tone on all of the skin. Um, that said, you probably don't need all of these unless you're really gonna get into figure painting. If I had recommendations, I would go with the medium flesh tone, the light flesh, the dark flesh, like I said. Um, the basic skin tone that comes with this is also very good. Again, these are all from Vallejo. Um, but I would recommend if you're gonna try and experiment with some, some figure painting and working on faces and stuff like that, I would get at least four skin tones. Um, a couple of medium range basic ones, um, like a medium flesh tone, like I said, or the basic skin tone, like I said, and then a, a lighter flesh tone and a darker flesh tone. So you can at least kind of experiment with shadows and highlights and stuff like that. Um, also important to note, as I mentioned, this is very clearly for lighter, fairer skin tones, Caucasian skin tones. This doesn't cover um, black and brown skin tones very well, which I think is kind of a miss from, from Vallejo here. And hopefully in recent years, they've remedied that issue. But um, for World War II era figures, if you're primarily painting um, figures that fought in that conflict, it is unfortunately gonna be mostly uh, white figures that are represented anyway. So. This is a good kit if you're doing a lot of Caucasian skin tones. Um, and I'm hoping to release a video in the near future on experimenting and trying to learn how to paint darker skin tones because it's an area where I need to practice more and it's an important skill to grow in this hobby. So basically though, if you're looking for a good flesh tone pack, I recommend a, a mix set from Vallejo. I'm not sure if this one's available anymore, but I'll link a very similar one in the description below if you're looking for a good pack of skin tones. Again, I would recommend at least going with three or four if you're gonna pick up some individual ones, a good mid-range flesh tone, a highlight, and a shadow. All right, so if you're gonna specifically be doing German figures, German infantry or tankers from World War II era, um, we got another multi-pack here. Vallejo does a really great six paint pack for figures. Um, this one is part of their War Games series, so it's for wargaming miniatures, but it works perfectly for 135 scale, 148 scale figures if that's your thing as well. Um, like I mentioned, there are six colors that come in this box and I think they really, really cover the range of tones that you're gonna need for your average German infantry figure or tanker or you name it. Um, the six that come in here, I'll read them off real quick. There's German camo dark green, German camo beige, German field gray, Luftwaffe camo green, green gray, German camo, sorry, and German camo medium brown. So some of the important ones there, um, for instance, and I'll reference this because it's actually really nice. They have a little figure diagram on the back of these boxes that shows you like a recommendation for which paints should go where on a figure. Just general rule of thumb here. Um, but German field gray, you're gonna use that a lot if you um, get used to painting German figures. Field gray is that basic grayish greenish tone um, of the, the like wool uniforms that you'd see. The standard German infantry uniform um, is gonna be that field gray. So you're gonna see that a lot. Um, in addition, let's see, camo beige. The camo beige, German camo beige, I really like this color um, and I use it for more things than just German figures. But this is for a lot of the packs and bags that he'd be carrying on his back there. Um, I won't go through all of them in detail here, but this is a good pack. So you'll find yourself needing all these colors. I have a tutorial on painting German infantry figures. Uh, the, to me, is great German infantry figure set in 135 scale. I will link that here so you can check it out. Um, 
it, it's a full tutorial on how to how to paint these guys from start to finish. And I use all of these colors and they're super handy. Um, but my recommendation is if you're gonna start painting figures for dioramas or to accompany your, your 135 scale vehicles, I would recommend picking up a six pack or any, any kind of multi-pack that's gonna give you the colors that you need. Um, I like the Vallejo one, like I said, but there are other manufacturers that make them as well. Um, it's just a good rule of thumb to pick up something. It's a good set that's manufactured specifically for this purpose, and it's gonna cover all your bases. In addition to that, um, there are a couple other colors that I use for German figures. I don't think I have it here. No, I left it in the other room. Um, but Ammo Mig makes a blue for figures. It's specifically designed for brush painting. I like to use that blue for my Luftwaffe pilot uniforms because it's kind of that stark, you know, royal blue. You should also have a flat black for doing German figures as well for the boots, the tall leather boots, um, as well as like the belt and some other things like that. So uh, six pack like this with these basic colors, I'll read them one more time. Camo dark green, uh, German camo beige, German field gray, Luftwaffe camo green, green gray, and German camo medium brown. Um, those are my recommendations if you're gonna be doing German figures and they should cover everything you need to do um, with German figures in 135 scale. All right, so our last section here, we're gonna talk about US figures. Um, these paints are great for painting US infantry figures, US tankers, you name it, in 135, 148, or 172 scale. Um, it's another multi-pack. This is from Vallejo. It's their, their War Games miniature set. Um, but again, this works for a variety of scales. And this comes with six paints. I'll read them off for you. Um, brown Violet, which you can see I only have five here. My Brown Violet, I can't place right now. I don't know what happened to it. Um, green Gray, Khaki, US Olive Drab. We love Olive Drab. Um, US Tan Earth and Red Leather. So these are some super versatile and really useful colors here. Obviously Olive Drab, any, any World War II US infantry uniform, tank, whatever. We're gonna be using Olive Drab. So US Olive Drab is just get this paint. You just need US Olive Drab. Um, this one is a little thicker than the one we talked about during the actual armor piece. I'm um, talking about American or British tanks and stuff. This one's specifically formulated for brush painting. So it's a little thicker. Um, so if you're doing figures, I like the Vallejo one. Um, on top of that, we've got our khaki. This is great for packs and bags um, and some like US coats and stuff like that. Our green gray. We have another green gray. This was also in the German infantry set, but this is also really helpful for, for packs and bags and stuff like that. Um, our tan earth, this color is really good for like big wool overcoats. Um, I just did some Battle of the Bulge figures. Um, I'll put a picture here, but I used this tan earth for their overcoats. That is a super handy color. And then this red leather is great for boots. I love this red leather. I use it for a lot of different things, um, but it's great for US GI boots. Another thing that's interesting to note here, um, important to note, is that stowage on vehicles. So if you're doing 135 scale vehicle models or 148 scale, it doesn't really matter. Um, and you see like Sherman tanks in particular, it's a good example. They've got packs and bags and stuff hanging all over them. Um, these colors are super handy for that. So if you think about it, if you've got a US infantryman, he's carrying his bag and everything, you're gonna use these colors. If there's a bag hanging on the side of a tank or a bedroll or something like that, it's gonna be these same colors. So this is a really good color palette to have if you're doing a lot of US work. Um, as I mentioned, this stuff is specifically formulated for brush painting. It's a little thicker and it works super well. So if you're gonna pick up any of these, if you don't wanna get the multi-pack, I do recommend getting a value pack like this. You'll save some money and you'll get all the pieces you need. But I would definitely recommend getting an olive drab, a khaki, and the red leather. I think those are super helpful, these three but I do recommend picking up the whole thing. Um, yeah, so if you're gonna be painting US infantry figures or US tankers to accompany your scale model builds, I recommend picking up this six pack, multi-pack set from Vallejo. It works super well for me. All right, guys, so that's it for me today. I know we covered a lot of paint in a really short amount of time and we had to move kind of fast here, but hopefully that gives you an idea and a starting point for some colors to pick up depending on whatever your next project is. Um, if you're new to the hobby, hopefully this makes things a little less overwhelming. I know there are so many paints out there to choose from, but these ones have worked really well for me and hopefully they work out well for you too. Again, I'm gonna have links to all these in the description below if you wanna pick them up for yourself. Um, some of the multi-packs might've changed a little bit. Mine are pretty old, honestly, and they've lasted me a long time. So I'll put the closest variant that I can find if you wanna pick those up. Um, and yeah, hopefully they work out really well for you. 
Again, this is, this is just my opinion. These are the paints that have worked out well for me over the years. Um, if you've got other stuff that's been great for you, if you've been scale modeling for a long time, you have some other recommendations, please leave a comment below so folks can check those out as well. Um, if you agree with my recommendations, I, I'd love to hear it too. I'd love to hear if you guys have had success with these paints and if you've got some different ideas, again, yeah, leave a comment below. Um, if you think this is a terrible list, I wanna hear it as well. Um, yeah, so I hope you guys got something out of this. If you're new to the hobby of scale modeling, welcome. It is a wonderful community of builders on here and everybody's super helpful and uh, we all wanna grow and just have a good time here. So welcome to the party, hope you enjoy it. Um, so yeah, if, if you enjoyed the video, please hit that like button. It really helps me grow the channel. Let's YouTube know that you like my stuff and you'll get some more recommendations. Um, also, you can subscribe for more scale modeling content. I try and post something new. I try and post something new just about once a week, um, running the gamut from armored vehicles to aircraft to figures, you, you name it. Um, so yeah, welcome aboard. If this is your first Spruce and, Bru Spruce and Bruce video, I, I hope you enjoyed it. Um, yeah, so that's it for me. Paint recommendations for beginners or paint recommendations for anybody really. This is my ultimate paint guide, we'll call it. Um, yeah, so I hope you enjoyed the video and until next time, be well, happy building, cheers.